All right, so in section 12.2, this question, I mean, this section is answering the question, to what extent are factors about, uh, are factors that we see in the languages across the world, to what extent are they due to inherited factors from previous language iterations? Or are they due to underlying cognitive constraints that we might have in our brain? We can answer this question by looking at those languages where there are more difficult rules to learn that seem more arbitrary and comparing them to languages uh, that are a little bit easier to learn and seeing how hard it is for children born to these parents that speak the more difficult language or the easier language. How, how easy is it for those children respectively to learn each language? But we'd have to control for a lot of different factors and it becomes a nightmare. So instead, the way we really practically answer this question is by inventing artificial languages. And we have these artificial languages with the properties that we're interested in. And then we look at how uh, at the at the at the properties that exist in the the languages, I should say, we look at how easy it is to learn these languages in the laboratory, and we compare them. Uh, we compare the artificial languages with the traits in the laboratory to the artificial languages out in the in the world at large, and we say if they seem to occur, if the if the, I should say if the ease of learning the languages in the artificial language in the in the laboratory setting. Are, occur with the same proportion or with the same ease as we see in the world at large, then there's probably some kind of cognitive mechanism constraining how languages work in, the, in, in our brains. Alternatively, if it seems like most languages are just as easy to learn in the lab, regardless of what rules they have, word order they have, etc., then we would say probably then the languages out in the world have certain characteristics that are merely inherited, that aren't related to some underlying cognitive structure. So here on page 482 and 43, we see uh, one experiment that answers this question in an interesting way. Table 12.3 outlines the proportion of languages across the world that use certain word orders. So 17% of the languages in the world use a noun adjective word order and then a numeral noun word order. That would be as if they were to describe a desk by the, using the phrase desk hard. That's a noun adjective, desk hard. And then a numeral noun, they would say like two desks. If, uh, if we look at the next grouping of languages, we see 27% of the languages in the world use an adjective noun and a numeral noun. That is to say a hard desk and two desks. English falls in this group. We're one of these 27%. 52%, the vast majority of languages in the world use a noun adjective and a noun numeral pairing, but only 4%, a very tiny minority, use an adjective noun and then a noun numeral. If we know this fact about languages in the world, we can create artificial languages in the laboratory that have some of these kinds of rules, these traits, and we can compare to what extent uh, or we can compare how easy it is to learn those artificial languages that we've invented in the laboratory. And we can say if we if it's just as difficult to learn an adjective noun and a noun numeral word or language, if it's if it's super hard to learn that, then we would expect in the laboratory to find that it's super hard and also in the world it's super hard. And because we would find it at only that only 4% of languages in the world follow that word order, and in the laboratory people have a very difficult time learning that word order, then there's some kind of cognitive constraint that's stopping people from mastering that, that particular pairing of word orders. So, and it should be particularly easy for people to learn in the laboratory a noun adjective, noun numeral word order because we expect that, I mean, because we see that there are, most languages in the world have that word order pairing. So if there's some kind of cognitive constraint going on, then we would expect that that's what we would find. On page 484, we see a detailing of uh, the experiment that, that analyzed this question. So there were certain nouns that the participants of the study had to learn. Those are detailed in panel A. You see the, the nerka, that's sort of a pear shape, and the wapoga, that's sort of a, um, I don't know, a two half circle, I mean a two, two overlapping uh, ovals shape. 
Anyway, after those words, those nouns, those shapes were learned, after the names of the shapes were learned, then the experimenters began to give them certain traits. They would be either colors, which would be an adjective, or they would be numbers. And they would create their artificial language so that when these word pairings were presented, like fushnerka or wapoga gif, or sorry yij, then when these um when these words were presented to the participants, they would occur with a certain frequency. There were exceptions to the rule, but on the whole, the rule would be that they would um that they would have like the adjective noun word order most of the time or the noun adjective word order most of the time right so those so the different proportions the different frequencies are detailed in that little table there under still under panel a but when the when the participants were tested they wanted to see to what extent did the participants generalize this rule so it only so each of these rules I mean, in the control condition, each of the uh, each of the word orders occurred with about fifty percent frequency. But in each of the experimental conditions, the word orders were uh, were distributed about seventy thirty. So we would see that there would, it would be much more common for one word order to occur than another. And they wanted the researchers wanted to see did the participants retain the the frequency of the word order in which we presented it. Or did they overgeneralize it? Did they assume that this is a rule across the language? And in panel C, you can see the graph. The control participants continued to uh, to, conti to continue to answer the test phase with 50% word order frequencies for each of the different types: the adjective noun, the noun adjective, numeral noun, and noun numeral. Those word orders will be presented about 50% each. But if we look at the um, the combinations of different word orders across the, uh, the across the experiment, there's four conditions. Then the ones that were easiest to learn, that is to generalize, were the three that were most common in the world. So compare those. Uh, if you look at if you look at the input conditions one through four, and you go back on the previous page to figure tw or to table twelve point three, then these proportions of languages across the world replicate onto the people's experience in this experiment. That is, the three most common languages in the world, or the three most common word order pairings in languages across the world were the most easily generalized and that one that's almost never occurs that four percent that wasn't generalized it wasn't even uh participants didn't even perform at the 70 percent that the researchers had presented the words with so that was a rule that didn't generalize they didn't understand the the word order in that ex in that ex experimental condition but importantly, condition one and two were very high. Condition three was lower. If you compare that to the table on 12.3, condition three is comparable to that one that's 17%. So you would expect that proportionally we would, we would find similar trends in the laboratory with this artificial language that we find out in the world at large. And that's exactly what these researchers found, suggesting that the answer to this question is that these naturally occurring trends that we see across languages in the world are actually resulting from biology and not from history necessarily. Though there are some historical and geographical components playing into the fact, playing into this, that uh, we find that this experiment suggests that to some extent these uh, these different types of uh, the, I guess the the ability for us to learn these different word orders is constrained by something going on in our brain, some cognitive construct. That then leads us to the next question. If we look at page 485, we see the one, two, three, fourth paragraph down ask this, asks this question. Given that these are biologically driven consistencies across the world, are they due to nativist or to anti-nativist processes? So the first language, the first question was, are they due to historical factors or cognitive factors? We answered probably due to cognitive factors. Now, are they due to nativist or anti-nativist cognitive processes? That's the question that we'll take up in the next recording.